Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Christmas month. It's got Christmas weather out there, right? Um, I'm so glad you guys are all here. Please stand. We're going to start our service with some worship.
thank you. Please take a second and shake hands with someone around you. and chill. So. And these are all trans crews, so yay. <laughs> All right, let's continue our worship together.
Welcome to Valley View this morning. You guys were all very brave to come through the rain. It was kind of a wet day out here, outside today. And, but look at the decorations up here. Thank you to Miss Marge and those that helped decorate. It's a nice warm place for us to worship the Lord this morning. And um, I'm going to go through some of the announcements. So. No ladies' Bible study this Thursday, December 7th. And there's an encouragement to come to the concert at Valley View at 7 p.m. instead. So that's going to be this Thursday. And then let's continue to pray for the short-term missions trip. I hear things are going well. Returning on Tuesday, I believe. And then... Go back. To it. Are you going back to I'm just trying to go back to the concert there. So the Vestal Community <coughs> Band concert will be December 7th. And then there's a Southern Tier uh, Christian Choir presentation. And our own Susan Lake will be singing. So we encourage you to support that. It's at 7 p.m on December 8th at Central Baptist Church. And are there more slides to go forward to? Senior luncheon will be December 13th, 12 p.m. It's always a good time, good food to eat, good fellowship. And then there's going to be a Christmas brunch, Sunday, December 17th, after the service. And remember to bring things. We have a program to help the homeless here at church. And things that are needed are for winter weather, warm clothes, coats, socks, warm shoes, blankets, paper bags. So at this time, we're going to we each month take a benevolent offering. So we'll have the ushers come forward for that. And this offering is to help those in need whether it be in our church or those that we know outside our church. So if you know of anybody in need, please feel free to approach the deacons or any of the elders or the pastor to let us know.
Good job, ushers. We're going to have Miss Marge come forward. She's going to have a presentation for us here. Thanks so much, guys, for that. And at this point in time, we can dismiss the kids for Children's Church. So this is the first Sunday of Advent, and it's known as Hope Sunday. Uh, and we, really, we celebrate Advent to look forward to the coming and remember the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ who is the true light of the world. The candle representing this Sunday is called the prophecy candle. It's typically a purple candle. Uh, it represents the anticipation of the coming of Christ. And it re reminds us of the prophecy for that foretells the coming of our Messiah. And I just thought I'd give a brief history of Advent. It's, uh, it can vary a little bit, but usually it's hope love, joy, and peace. In the next few Sundays, we're going to take a little break from our uh, messages in John and just uh, going through these virtues that uh, Jesus has brought to us. And Advent definitely refers to the coming of Christ. The second candle uh, by tradition is called the Bethlehem candle. It reminds us of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, and that was foretold. And that's typically a purple candle. So you'll have to, we're not doing Advent candles this season, but you can just, in your mind, imagine a purple candle. The third is called the Shepherd's Candle, where we rejoice like the shepherds on Christmas Eve. And it's, it's really special that the first people that, that the angels appear to and told about the birth of Christ were shepherds who were considered to be somewhat outcasts, maybe low lower members of the society at that time. But it was uh, God's plan that this message would be for everyone. And he started with those that were very humble. And then the fourth candle is called the peace candle, generally a white candle, and represents the purity of Jesus, who was sinless and brings us personal peace and ultimately will bring peace to our world. Uh, Third candle is generally pink, and the last one is white. So that's a brief little survey of Advent. I want to read from. I want to read from Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven, and that reads: For unto us a child is born, uh, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign over David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And that's from Isaiah chapter 9. And the zeal of the Lord is um, an interesting term. Uh, it, it refers to 
making sure the process will be complete. And our Lord has a plan, and he's going to work it out. And sometimes we don't see the plan. We don't understand the completeness of the plan when, when difficulties come along in our lives, but he has a plan. And that's something we can kind of be sure of and have assurance of. The definition of zeal is uh, a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or objective. And uh, the zeal of the Lord assures us of God's love for us, his unstoppable devotion and relentless commitment to accomplishing his purposes in our lives. Maybe you can help me go back. Yeah. Thank you so much. So this hope we know as followers of Jesus is more than a casual saying of I hope so. Because uh, sometimes we hope something's going to happen tomorrow. And that's just, not, we're not sure of it. But because Christian hope is a matter of faith, our hope is characterized by confidence rather than wishful thinking. This The, the hope that we have as Christians is spoken of in Hebrews 6, 19, which I'd like to read for you. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. And the NIV reads further on, uh, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, this is our great hope and assurance as Christians and followers of Jesus that after his death, we will live with him. He has made a way through Jesus. And uh, he's been called the way maker. You know, he has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our hope in Jesus is securely anchored to the word of God, which contains his will and purposes, so we're not tossed by every wind of uncertainty. So when circumstances come into our life, when something bad happens, uh, we can be assured that God has a plan, despite what circumstances might look like. The term behind the veil is interesting. It refers to Jesus who is seated at the right hand of God and by virtue of his death on the cross, we too are permitted to enter into the holy place beyond the curtain. So someday, that is the promise that we can be sure of, and we can be sure of that hope. So biblical hope is exclusively Christian. If, if, if we don't know Jesus, we really can't have biblical hope. Only those who have placed their hope in Jesus Christ can have this hope. And Christian hope looks for a fulfillment in the future. Uh, and it requires us to wait. We have to be patient. Christian hope is, is characterized by endurance and perseverance. And it really is a sure hope based on the promise God gives us in his word and, and on the death and resurrection of Jesus. A definition of Christian hope could be and is hope is the confident expectation of future changes that God has promised but that are not seen, which Christians strongly desire and for which the Christian eagerly waits for. So, Pastor Moses had uh, outlined a, a uh, scripture in Luke that I'm going to read in a second for us. But I wanted, before we uh, read, read the scripture together, I read for you, I wanted to uh, examine the book we read from. Uh, the, the Bible is really a reflection of its author. The, the Bible was written through human authors in the process called inspiration. In 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, 
for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be fairly equipped for every good work. Um, God's word, the Bible, is literally our instruction manual and guidebook for life. And that is why our daily devotion time, reading the Bible, listening to the Holy Spirit as we study God's scriptures to teach us is so important in our walk as Christians. We, we believe God, the God who created the universe is capable of writing a perfect book. Yeah. The uh, Bible judges us, we don't judge the Bible. I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. In John uh, 6, 67 through 69, uh, this is the passage where, where uh, Jesus has witnessed the departure of many of his disciples, disciples that were followers of Jesus, but were not true dedicated followers of Jesus. And so uh, he asks, he says to his disciples, do, do you not want to leave too, do you? Uh, and Peter speaks, Lord, to whom, we have, to whom shall we go? You alone are, have the words of eternal life. So, you know, here we talk about, Peter, here's impetuous Peter, he speaks the truth. Uh, without, you know, without God, without the Bible, without his word, there's really no other way to eternal life and into the presence of God other than believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins and following him. So it's just so important we understand that. So today we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 1. I'll start in verse 5. And we're studying and reading about a man and his wife who had been praying to have a baby for many years. And the man's name was Zachariah. And his wife's name was Elizabeth. And we'll be reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Through 25. So if you would like to follow along, there are Bibles in the pew and feel free to follow along. This is uh, entitled, The Birth of John the Baptist Foretold. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all God's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. They were both well along in their late years. One Zachariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to give him the name of John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And 
I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because that you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and for he kept making signs to them, and, but remained unable to speak. When his time with service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown me favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In that time, in that culture, not to have a child was felt to be disgraceful. disgraceful. It, it wasn't, but that was just the custom of the day. So I think one of the hopeful signs in our life is new life, right? You have someone that passes away, then a new baby comes in the family, and, and any Disney fans here, I don't know, but uh, just came to my mind that there's a new baby. And uh, Psalm 127 is a verse that talks about the blessing of children. Uh, it, it says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring and a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man, and I would say, or woman, whose quiver is full of them. And that's from Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Can you help me advance that slide? Oh, there it is. Sorry. So these are flowers from my garden from last spring. Little crocuses, simple little things that come up, but they are a sign of hope. We're facing a long winter here, right? We know it's gonna be cold for quite a few months. You're not gonna see your neighbors for a while. But the, this, yeah, I thought, was a sign of hope. And there's, I, I wanna just read from Luke 12, 27. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So there are many things that God gives us in this physical world that I think give us hope. And even when maybe tragedy happens or something bad happens in your life, you can go out for a walk and maybe it's nighttime, you look up at the stars and see the beauty or you feel, you see, feel the breeze on your face. And, and I think those physical things, at least for me, are, are hopeful things that God has give, given to us because we know he's the creator of everything as the Bible tells us. I, I wanted to say a, a few words about shadows before we get into um, the scripture. So the Bible uses the word shadow to represent God's provision and protection for us, and that's a sign of hope. Um, Zachar Isaiah 51, 16, I'll read for you, as I have put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand, I who set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth, and tell Zion, you are my people. So that's just a wonderful promise of hope. And um, Have you guys eaten at Core Life? You could make this shadow on a sunny day if you can find a sunny day in Binghamton. But, so that's Alice and me and Beth. And uh, they have those little outdoor heaters there. And they're supported by these little metal cross beams and it just happened there was this lovely shadow uh, that was there and uh, the verse that I have with with this is um, Psalm 36 7 how priceless is your unfailing love O God people who take refuge in the shadow of your wings I have another picture with Beth sticking her tongue out but I didn't know if that would be appropriate to show, but I'll just mention that for a little humor. So going on to our, our text today, Zechariah was a, a priest in the division of Abijah. And every uh, 
preparing the, this, this message today was educational for me so, because every pre descendant of Aaron was automatically a priest. So at that time, uh, they estimate there were probably 24,000 priests uh, that would have been eligible to burn incense. And obviously, there's only so many days in a year, and they, I think, burned incense, from my recollection, twice a day. So they, uh, they would choose by lot, as it says in the scripture here, who would burn incense. And many would never have the privilege of burning incense. Sorry, there's a little bit of a day. Okay, thanks for helping me. So Zechariah would have really been thrilled. I mean, this was uh, to, to have been chosen to burn incense. And, and you know, what, what you think of, what, would, what were the chances that he would have been picked? It was, I'm not a mathematician, but maybe Darren could figure out the chances with that many people of being picked. But it would, yeah, it would be pretty crazy, yeah. So, so let's just consider, was Zacharias choosing by chance, or was it a God-planned happening? Or one could say a miracle. And I would say it was a God-planned happening, because it wasn't too likely. And God chose that instance of him being all alone, in a sense, because he would have been not in the Holy of Holies. This was not the, the time when the priests, the high priest went into the Holy Holies, and they had to tie ropes to him in case he passed out because no one else could go in there and they could drag him out. This was kind of between the two courts, but the people would have been waiting outside. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I have a quote by him, it says, miracles are retelling in small letters of the very same story that is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. So that's an intellectual's way of putting it, but what I would say, you know, is that sometimes I wonder if many of life happenings may be God-determined events that I don't really recognize as such. Um, and, you know, we know God cares for us every day. He sustains us in, in our lives. So, um, and I think sometimes we fail to recognize that the hand of God is in our lives and uh, that he's watching over us constantly. Uh, so, moving on. Thank you. So, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was also a descendant of the line of Aaron, uh, and both were very old. Elizabeth was not able to have a child. And, you know, e even in our society today, I know there are women that struggle to have children. And I know that's a difficult thing in their, in their, in their life. So, both were righteous before God, observing God's commands and and decrees blamelessly, the scriptures tell us. So they were not without sin, but they chose, they made a, a, a choice in their life to follow the words of God, to follow the commandments of God, to try to uh, live as God would have them to live. And so they, they were righteous in God's sight, sight. Not sinless, but righteous in God's sight. And then the other thing we know about Elizabeth, that she that uh, she was a relative to Mary. And we don't know exactly, but we do know that probably Elizabeth was quite a bit older than Mary was. Because it says, I like the way that Zacharias says it in the scriptures. Uh, he says, I am a very old man, and my wife is well along in years. So maybe that was a gentler way of saying that she was old uh, as well. So... Yeah. Got to be careful with those things, right? Those guys do. Yeah. And then Gabriel Angel then appears to Zechariah. And uh, Gabriel's one of the two angels mentioned in Scripture. The other was Michael Dean's namesake, Michael. I don't know if you were named after the archangel Michael, but, Michael, but maybe you were. Um, and Zechariah's understandably startled and afraid. I think when angels appear, if I saw an angel, I'd probably be pretty fearful. Uh, in the, in the, you know, in the, 
the uh, shepherds were fearful. The scriptures taught us when the angels appeared to him. Um, Gabriel's message was, do not be afraid, Zechariah. First thing he said, and your prayers have been heard, he said. That was another part of the message. And God heard Zechariah's prayer for a child. Uh, scripture from 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 12, I read, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and the ears are open to their prayers. And I think this is a wonderful promise. So, you know, we're, we pray to the Lord. You know, we pray for Thanksgiving. We pray as a congregation. We pray privately. And just know that God hears your prayers. And God has a different time frame than us in terms of prayers. And uh, that kind of goes on to my next slide here. It just indicates that prayers are never lost or forgotten, and that's a wonderful thing, right? Uh, you might call someone on your cell phone and they won't respond, but when we talk to God, he hears us. Um, and then the question comes, uh, were Zachariah and Elizabeth still praying? And it may be that they weren't still praying, because at a certain point in time, you pray for something, right? And maybe you stop. We're too old to have children, right? So they said, why should we pray that for that anymore? But the scriptures say here, your prayers have been heard. So even if they hadn't been praying, maybe for five or ten years, because they thought they were too old to even have children, uh, God heard their, their prayers and answered them. And it's, it's fortunate that God does remember uh, our prayers. And just one of the commentators said, there's no shelf life for prayer. So that's pretty cool to, to think about. Thank you. So Gabriel's message, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of him. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never take wine and be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before his birth, and he will bring many back to their Lord. And it's so true that, you know, John had a message of repentance. Uh, he asked people to turn for their sins, and there were many, many, according to the scriptures, that turned to the Lord um, because of John's message. Um, I would read one commentator that the Jewish historian Josephus actually wrote more about John the Baptist than he did about Jesus. He wrote about both of them, but there are more comments about John the Baptist. So he had a real impact. And uh, it's interesting about never taking wine, uh, and, and that makes you think of the Nazarite vow. And uh, that goes back to the scriptures, I think, in Numbers that talk about a, a vow was a dedication to God for a period of time. Um, it might be like a period of fasting that we might do today to pray and dedicate ourselves to the Lord. And this could be done either by a man or a woman. So it's interesting that scriptures actually say that. And we think of some of those that were, had, Samson was an example in the Old Testament, the Nazarite, Samuel, and of course John the Baptist. So the birth of John the Baptist was fulfilled in prophecy. It, it, he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. He will bring back many people to the Lord their God. Is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, I'll read for you. Uh, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then, Malachi 3.1 also predicts the coming of a, a messenger, which was John the Baptist. It, it reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, said the Lord of hosts. So this, the coming of John the Baptist, who would, predict, who would uh, prepare the way for our Lord Jesus, was predicted. Um, so let's examine Zechariah's questions and doubts. He, he asked the question, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, my wife is along in years. 
And, and I, I would say, from my reading of this scripture here, that Gabriel is not particularly happy with this response. And I believe, but I believe Zechariah kind of has a valid concern. How is this possible? He's a whole man. He knows it's not possible in human terms. So what, the thing is, what is possible, impossible for man is possible for God. So this is Jesus' response in Luke chapter 18 when he was talking to a rich young ruler. And you may remember that story where the ruler came to him and said, you know, I've kept the law and I thought, what, what must I do to be saved? And the, his response to the rich young ruler was, you must sell what you have and follow me. And the, the emphasis on, you know, dedicating his life to following Jesus. And... Uh, So Zechariah knew this was humanly impossible. And Gabriel's response, and I can almost sense Gabriel's frustration with this situation. Gabriel indicates he is an angel who stands in the presence of God. And he says he's been sent to speak to Zechariah and give him good news. And uh, I'm just thinking about Gabriel coming from the throne room of God. And I can really only imagine what it might like to be in the throne room of God, to be present in that situation. I think someday we're going to be there, and we just can't, we don't, we can't understand it, and I don't think Zachariah can understand it either. And Gabriel was probably thinking that this man has no idea where I came from and what it's like to be in the presence and power of the majesty of God who reigns. And honestly, I don't think we can imagine it either. So it's just an interesting thought. You can advance that slide. Okay. So it, it, the scriptures tell us that Zechariah was unable to speak because of his unbelief when he came out. So, and it says, it, it actually says, he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So. Uh, I don't know if anyone likes games here, but in our household we like games, and I just thought gestures. So I, I hope that Zachariah was good at charades, because uh, that's basically what he was doing when he came out. And you know, it's uh, and uh, the other thing that I think is probably pretty cool is to imagine the time when he was able to share with his wife Elizabeth, "Hey, we're going to have a child after all these years," and what her response is. I would think maybe. She became a little tearful, I think, at that point. So the scripture is also describing, uh, in our text today, say, say that John the Baptist will be a joy and delight to you. And I just don't want to miss this promise from the angel. Because, you know, when I think of John the Baptist, I think of him as a man. I think of him in the desert, in his unusual clothing, and uh, but I don't think of him as a child. And I just think... He, he probably, you know, with parents, you know, their fir your first child's first rollover, uh, you know, first word, first steps, yeah, those are things we, as parents we treasure and give us joy and delight as we raise our children. And uh, many of, uh, of you and myself were blessed to have children in our home and be able to have the privilege of raising them. Uh, uh, this is something. And then I think... I'm sure John's parents were very proud of him as a young man for what he accomplished, too, uh, as well. So John the Baptist is a man. Uh, he would be called the prophet of the Most High. He grew up to be strong in spirit and lived in the wilderness until he publicly began to uh, reach out to others. John preached the baptism of, of repentance from sins. And he was a voice calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, that he, he was to prepare the way of the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, it kind of describes his dress. And he, uh, John the Baptist, wore a garment of camel hair and a leather belt. Uh, he, his food was lucus, locust and wild honey. And it, it reminds me very much of the prophet Elijah's garb and, and his, his manner as well. And in a sense, wearing clothes like that or like sackcloth in the Old Testament was a sign of repentance for sin. And that was 
one of John the Baptist's big messages, turn from your sins and turn back to God. And the other message was the Messiah is coming. And John introduces uh, Jesus. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Matthew chapter 3, the Bible tells us that John baptized Jesus and God descended like a dove and said, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. And John uh, in the scriptures was not anxious to baptize Jesus, but Jesus uh, encouraged him to do so that all things, I think the scriptures say that all things would be fulfilled. And then just to follow John the Baptist, you know, he was eventually in prison. He rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to his brother's wife, Herodias, and was put in prison. And uh, you may remember the story of when John was in prison. And, you know, when you're in prison, that's not a very comfortable situation to be in. And uh, so John asked the two disciples that came to visit him, go to Jesus and say, ask him, are you the one to come after me? Or shall we wait for another? And that may surprise you, right? Here's John the Baptist. He was a relative of Jesus. He was in the wilderness. He spoke of Jesus coming. He baptized Jesus. And here he's asking Jesus, are you the one? But, you know, it, it's just, we saw Zachariah's doubt that, that God would be able to give his wife Elizabeth and then a child. And, uh, but it's not that Zacharias didn't have faith, too. So that kind of lets us understand that, that faith and doubt are something that we can experience as Christians and that it's okay. So Jesus' answer to John's doubt was interesting. It, um, he didn't say, I'm the one, but he just said, uh, the, he, he said, tell John, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account with me. And these were words of hope to encourage John, who was facing persecution and evident death. And no doubt he was discouraged in his situation at that time. So I think that's just a good lesson to us. Let's just talk a little bit about doubt since we're on the subject. So I'm going to read a passage here from Mark chapter 9, verse 20 through 24. So it reads, So they brought him And this was a story about a uh, father and his son. And his, his son was inhabited by a spirit that uh, was doing all sorts of bad things to him. So when they brought him, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at his mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. So here's a Bible story that kind of outlines faith and doubt right at the same time. So they're, they're kind of right there together. So I thought that was instructional for us. So let's talk about Doubting Thomas. Poor Doubting Thomas, right? He gets a bad rep. And uh, I think it's a little unfair that he has this title. You know, he, he says to, uh, to the disciples, Jesus wasn't there with him at the time, unless I see the nail prints in his hands or put my fingers where the nails were, I will not believe. And then it's about a week later that Jesus appears to the disciples and I believe makes a special trip. So Thomas can put his fingers into his side, into his hands, and actually see evidence of the resurrected Jesus. And he doesn't berate Thomas, but tries to encourage Thomas to believe. 
And then uh, to Thomas's credit, let's not forget that it was Thomas. When the, remember the story when they were going to, Lazarus has died, and they were going to Jerusalem to, uh, to attend to, uh, to Lazarus. And the disciples, some of, most of the disciples said, don't go, they're going to kill you. They were really fearful. But Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with, with him. So Thomas had some courage in him too. So uh, uh, moving on, so uh, John's death. You know, John would go on to be martyred at age 32. He obviously was just a little older than Jesus, right? Because he was born before Jesus. And uh, there's a scripture in Psalm 116 that reads, uh, let's read it here for you. Uh, it says, precious in the sight is the Lord, of the Lord and of the depth of his seeds. So, sorry. But uh, I think that's very meaningful to me. And Jesus, on hearing of John's death from his disciples, with the scriptures say he withdrew by boat to a solitary place. That's in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. And, uh, you know, it just it doesn't say he went to pray, but, you know, usually when Jesus went away in a boat, in most instances of the scripture, it was to pray. So, you know, I'm sure that Jesus was very affected by John the Baptist's death. And uh, there's, you know, when, when the Christian man or woman dies, you know, God knows, and it's very precious in his sight. And that's a, a wonderful promise for us. So, and Jesus had praise for John the Baptist in the scripture, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, uh, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is the least in this kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Uh, and that's from Matthew 11, 11. And, uh, you know, that, that last statement is interesting. He, he, he speaks uh, of John and elevates him as a man, but uh, then goes on to say, uh, Whoever is least in the kingdom is even greater than he. And that, than he, and that just indicates that uh, Jesus really values humility, and and that would be something that would be important for us to understand. So a little more. So hope. And, uh, I just wanted to review briefly hope in the Old Testament, and uh, it's interesting that the word hope is first used in Ruth chapter one verse twelve. That's one of the things we've just taken a little study. Sunday morning in our, our, our Sunday school class. And this is where Naomi says, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? And she's talking, uh, Naomi's talking to Ruth and Orpha, her, her, her two daughters-in-law. So even though hope is not used uh, until Ruth, the word hope in the Old Testament, it's woven through the Old, Old Testament like a ribbon. And I just wanted to uh, talk about Eve. We think about uh, Eve as having a, a legacy of sin because we know that uh, she and Adam, let's not forget Adam as well, uh, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were forbidden God, by God to do. And then they were separated by God for, from their sin. But Eve has really a, another legacy, and it's really a hopeful legacy, because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So uh, he will crush your head as a reference to the ultimate fate of Satan, because we know in the end that Satan's going to be cast down and conquered. And you will crush his heel is a reference to the death of Jesus on the cross to cleanse all who believe on him from, his, uh, from their sins. Isaiah 53.10 makes reference to this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has been put to grief. When you make his soul as offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Certainly life was not easy for Adam and Eve. When you think of Cain killing Abel, that had to be horrible for Adam and Eve. But God gave Adam and Eve another son. His name was Seth. And the, the, 
the name Seth means given or appointed. And Seth was not the promised one, but through Seth's line, and we see in Luke's genealogy, Seth is there, would come Jesus. So that was a very hopeful sign in Eve's life. This hope in God's faithfulness in providing a way back to a right relationship with God was not just for the Jews, but for the Gentile nations as well. In Isaiah 42, 6, it reads, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. So God's message was not just for the Jews, for the Gentiles, way back even in the Old Testament. I wanted to use the example of, uh, of King David. So uh, David in Psalm 25 says, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. And also another quote from David is, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and Savior, and my hope is in you all the day long. David's, uh, David demonstrates his sure hope for life after death, after the death of the baby born to him in Bathsheba, his wife. And in Sam, I'll just read from Samuel, 2 Samuel 12. Uh, David has been mourning and, and praying with God for, to preserve the life of this baby. But what he says is, while the baby was still alive, I fasted and I cried. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will feel sorry for me and let the baby live. But now the baby is dead. Why should I fast? I can't bring him back to life. Someday I will go to him, but he cannot come back to me. I've always liked that story because it shows David's hope and it, it reflects our hope for seeing our loved ones again. Job, uh, amidst his suffering, and he suffered very, very much, has this cry of hope and this is from Job 19, 27, 25 through 27, and it reads, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. So I think that's, that's just a wonderful promise. You know, it's something that we as, if you are a follower of Jesus, you, you know for sure that you're going to see the face of Jesus someday. And that's, that's a wonderful hope. What about hope after the death of a loved one? This is an event that all of us must experience, whether it be death of a grandparent, a mother, father, a wife, a husband, a brother, sister, or even a child. So I bet everybody in this room, whether you're young or old, has been touched by the death of a family member or a loved one it would be probably hard to find someone who has not. And um, I was given, a, you may have heard of Elizabeth Elliot, you know, who um, was a missionary. Her first husband was killed down in Ecuador. And uh, she has a, a very nice pamphlet called Facing the Death of Someone You Love. And I just wanted to read what she reads because it was, kind of helpful to me what she said. So. Oh, here she is. So she says, I am convinced that every death what, of whatever kind through which we are called to go must lead to a resurrection. This is the core of Christian faith. Death is the end, end of every life and leads to resurrection, the beginning of a new one. It is a progression, a proper progression, the way things are meant to be, the necessary means of ongoing life. And why this meant something to me is because, you know, we, we don't want to go through the death of a loved one, but sometimes we have to. And in a sense, it is a natural progression if we understand that someday, ultimately, this life is not the end. That there's a life for those who believe in Jesus to be in the presence of God, in the presence of loved ones again that have gone on before. So that, 
was helpful to understand. So, um, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Uh, and I like the word sleep, because when you sleep, you go to sleep and you wake up again. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Can we advance that slide? So, it is my hope that as we approach the Christmas season, I just have a few points here, then we'll finish up, that we can rejoice and celebrate in the true meaning of Christmas, that Jesus has come to earth and made his way back, made our way back to a right relationship with God our Father. The second point is that we have the scriptures, God's word, an instruction manual to help us live in hope and anticipation. And the third point, that we are, we as followers of Jesus have the sure hope of seeing our loved ones again and seeing Jesus face to face, as Job said. And the last thing is that we have opportunities to share this great hope with those who do not know and trust in Jesus yet. And I just think that maybe summarizes for me what my hope for this Christmas season will be. So, um, we're going to celebrate uh, communion together today, so I'll ask the elders to come forward, and we'll pass out the cups and plates and have communion together, and uh, after communion, we'll be finished with the service. We won't have any closure song. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. So I'm just going to read a little brief, briefly from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So this, this is Paul writing. For, for I received from the Lord what I have passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body for which is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. So let's take the bread together. In the next verse, it reads, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread 
and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let's take the cup together. And so we have a lot to hope for in our daily lives. You know, I, I'm so thankful for the Lord, for the support he gives me and gives you. I'm very thankful for each member of this church. I, I love the community that we have together and the friends that we have here together. Uh, I'll just close this in prayer, then you'll be dismissed, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, that you would um, send your son as a, a baby and as a man to live amongst us and to be raised by mother and father from a small infant, that he would grow into be a man and that he would somehow be a man God who would die on the cross for our sins and then that he would give us the Holy Spirit and the wonderful promises that we have in your word of hope. And I thank you for this. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.